everyone. Today we're going to be reviewing types of chemical bonds. On your ATITs exam, you might be presented with a question like, which of the following is an ionic bond? Or circle the following polar covalent bonds? Or which of the following represents a nonpolar covalent bond? By the end of this video, you are going to be able to answer all of these questions confidently. Let's go ahead and get started. Atoms either lose, gain, or share electrons. This is what forms a bond between two atoms. Atoms form bonds in order to satisfy the octet rule. The octet rule states that elements combine in such a way that each atom has eight electrons filling their valence shell. In order for this to happen, each atom must give up or gain or share electrons. We know that the valence shell refers to the outermost shell on an atom and the valence electrons are all of the electrons on that valence shell. So eight electrons filling up the valence shell is going to make these atoms very, very happy. The elements highlighted here are our noble gases, and all elements strive to become like the noble gases. They look up to the noble gases because these noble gases are the most stable elements because they naturally have a full valence shell. They naturally have eight electrons filling up their valence shell, with one exception. That exception is helium. It only has two electrons in its valence shell, and it doesn't strive to be like all the other elements. It is perfectly fine with only having two. Metals lose electrons because they have fewer electrons in their outer shell. So because they have fewer electrons in their outer shell, it makes it easier for them to just lose a couple rather than gain a bunch. You will clearly see this once you see some examples. So here we have potassium as an example, and potassium has 19 electrons total. Notice it only has one valence electron in that valence shell. So because potassium is a metal, it is going to lose this one valence electron. Once that electron is lost, the shell is now empty. Therefore, potassium really doesn't need this shell and it's basically going to disappear. Once that shell disappears, the shell underneath actually has eight electrons and this is now going to be the new valence shell. Because potassium lost one electron, that means it has not 19, but 18 total electrons now. So potassium with 19 protons and 18 electrons creates a cation with a plus one charge. So the takeaway here is metals lose electrons because they have fewer electrons in their outer shell. Also, metals form cations, which are ions with a positive charge. Non-metals, on the other hand, gain electrons because they have more electrons in their outer valence shell. For example, we have fluorine here and it has nine total electrons. Notice it has seven valence electrons. Here we have this atom floating by and it has one valence electron. It's actually going to give this valence electron to fluorine. And now fluorine is going to have a full valence shell. It has eight electrons or eight valence electrons in its outer shell. And now fluorine is happy. So just like we did with the metals, we now have to look at the total number of electrons and adjust it. Fluorine has gained one electron, so now it has a total of 10 electrons, not nine. Fluorine has nine protons, and again, that's never ever going to change because remember the number of protons will never change in an atom. But now it has 10 electrons, so this creates an anion with a negative one charge. The takeaway here is nonmetals gain electrons because they have more electrons in their outer shell. Nonmetals also form anions, which are ions with a negative charge. So notice that this is the exact opposite of metal characteristics. Now that we understand how metals and nonmetals work when they create a bond, let's see exactly how they create ionic bonds. Ionic bonds will have a metal and a nonmetal bonded together. The atoms that form ionic bonds will either lose or gain electrons, and this is referred to as a transfer of electrons. Here we have sodium and chlorine atoms. Sodium is our metal, chlorine is our nonmetal, 
So automatically we know we have an ionic bond because we have a metal and a non-metal coming together. Now you know that if you ever see a metal and non-metal together, you know automatically it's going to be an ionic bond. Our sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons and our chlorine has 17 protons and 17 electrons. Sodium would look a bit like this and chlorine would look like this. Notice sodium, our metal, has only one electron on its valence shell and chlorine, our non-metal, has seven electrons on its valence shell. So again, our metal is going to lose its electron and our non-metal is going to gain electrons during this ionic bond. This little guy is going to make its way over there and that is a transfer of an electron. Now notice sodium has a shell that has no electrons on it, so it doesn't need the shell. It's going to completely lose it and underneath it, it has a nice eight electrons in that new valence shell. So sodium is happy and chlorine is also happy because it also has eight electrons in its valence shell. There is one last thing we need to adjust after filling up these valence shells. On the metal, we have lost one electron, so now sodium doesn't have 11 electrons, it now has 10. This sodium turns into a cation with a plus one charge. Chlorine has gained one electron, so it doesn't have 17 anymore, it has 18. Chlorine is now an anion with a negative one charge. So sodium is our positively charged atom and chlorine is our negatively charged atom. As we know, opposites attract. So this is what keeps ionic bonds together. It's that attraction of opposite charges. Metals are generally least electronegative and nonmetals are most electronegative. Because nonmetals are more electronegative, it means that they are better at attracting electrons towards them. So nonmetals will always attract electrons from the metals. That's why they gain electrons and metals are the ones that lose the electrons. So let's go ahead and move on to covalent bonds. Here we're going to work with two nonmetals bonding together. Atoms that form covalent bonds share electrons, so there is no transferring electrons here. Uh, one atom is not going to lose or gain electrons. Instead, these atoms are sharing these electrons. One thing important to remember is that all diatomic molecules have covalent bonds between the same atoms. And if you need a reference, remember, these are all of your diatomic molecules listed here. For example, here we have nitrogen, and let's just say another nitrogen comes along, and that nitrogen says, Hey, want to get together so we both have a full valence shell? Heck yeah, let's get together and become diatomic molecules. So they come together, they become diatomic molecules, and the both of them live happily ever after. All of these diatomic molecules are going to look very similar to this nitrogen. They're going to form a bond that is covalent between them. Let's look at an example of covalent bonds that is not between diatomic molecules. Say for example, CO2. For the sake of simplicity, I'm only going to draw the valence shell with the valence electrons. So just wanna let you know that so you don't get confused. Not all of the electrons are going to be drawn on these atoms. So here we have the carbon valence shell and these are our two oxygens valence shells. Notice that the oxygen has six electrons in its valence shell and carbon has four electrons in its valence shell. Remember, these atoms have one goal in mind, and that's to fill up their valence shell with eight electrons. So carbon is going to take two electrons and share it with both of the oxygen. And oxygen is also going to take one of its electrons and share it with the carbon. So now this is all rearranged, and we'll notice that oxygen now has eight electrons filling its valence shell. And carbon also has eight electrons filling its valence shell. So all atoms are happy with full shells. Now let's see how electronegativity relates to the covalent bonds. In a covalent bond, one atom will always be slightly more negative than the other. And of course, that means that the other atom will be slightly more positive. Now, the key word here is slightly because if they were completely negative or completely positive, that would make them have charges and that would mean they were ionic. 
The atom that is more electronegative will be the more negative atom. This atom, of course, attracts more electrons around it. And in case you need to refresh your memory, this is the electronegativity trend on the periodic table. Remember, fluorine is our most electronegative atom. As we go from left to right or towards fluorine, the electronegativity increases. And as we go up the periodic table, electronegativity also increases. If we use our example of hydrogen and chlorine bond, if we look for both of these atoms on the, on the periodic table, we will notice that chlorine is obviously more electronegative. Therefore, it attracts more electrons around it, and this makes chlorine partially negative. We're going to represent this partially negative with a delta sign and a negative sign after it. By the way, delta means slightly, so slightly negative. And hydrogen is less electronegative. It has less electrons around it. This makes hydrogen partially positive. And we're going to represent this with the delta sign again and a positive sign, so slightly positive. Let these delta signs be a reminder that these atoms are not ionic. They are not fully positive or negative. They are just slightly positive and slightly negative. Remember, delta means slightly. When the difference in electronegativity between two atoms is equal to or more than 0.5, this is called polar, polar covalent bond. So let's use our example of hydrogen and chlorine. Normally you will be given the electronegativity value. Here hydrogen has a value of 2.1 and chlorine has a value of 3.0. So this is how we calculate the difference between the two values. We basically just subtract them and we'll end up with 0.9. 0 0.9 .9 is the total difference in electronegativity between hydrogen and chlorine. In order for this to be a polar covalent bond, the electronegativity difference between the two atoms must be equal or more than 0 0.5. So because the electronegativity difference between hydrogen and chlorine is 0 0.9, the two atoms form a polar bond or a polar covalent bond. If the electronegativity is less than 0 0.5, the covalent bond is nonpolar. Although there is still one atom that is slightly more positive and the other is slightly more negative, the difference is still not significant enough to call it polar. Let's take, for example, these hydrogen atoms. The electronegativity value is 2.1, and of course, it's the same value for both atoms because they are the exact same atoms. Because the electronegativity between both atoms is the same, there is an equal sharing of electrons between the two. This goes for any diatomic molecule like oxygen, fluorine, and all of the other diatomic molecules, they will have a nonpolar covalent bond. Let's go ahead and finish off with some practice problems. Here we have hydrogen attached to another hydrogen. Is this an ionic bond, a polar covalent bond, or a nonpolar covalent bond? The first thing we want to look at is automatically rule out if this is an ionic bond. If it's an ionic bond, it will be a metal and a nonmetal. Hydrogen is a nonmetal, so this is actually nonmetal and nonmetal, so it's not ionic, it's covalent. Now let's determine if it is a polar or nonpolar covalent bond. Because it is a diatomic molecule and is the exact same atom attached to each other, that means the electronegativity is exactly the same. So this is a nonpolar covalent bond. How about carbon and hydrogen with the values of 2.5 and 2.1? This is a nonpolar covalent bond because if we look at the difference between the two electronegativity values, we get 0.4. Remember, polar is any difference of 0.5 or more. So because it's only 0.4, it makes this bond nonpolar. How about calcium and sulfur? Calcium is a metal and sulfur is a nonmetal. Therefore, we know automatically we have an ionic bond. What about oxygen and hydrogen with values of 3.5 and 
If we find the difference of the two values, we get 1.4, which is going to make this a polar covalent bond. What about H2O? Now, I added a little extra stuff here just to make it look a little more complicated, but that's just the reality. You might see something like this on your exam. Focus on the electronegativity values and find the difference of the values. The electronegativity difference here is 1.4, so that's going to make H2O a polar covalent bond. By the way, we automatically ruled out ionic bond because hydrogen and oxygen are both non-metals. Also, I want to introduce this symbol here called a dipole moment. The arrow points in the direction of the most electronegative atom. In this case, both arrows are pointing in the direction of the oxygen. Next, we have nitrogen bonded to nitrogen. We know this is a diatomic molecule, therefore, we automatically know it's a nonpolar covalent bond. Next, we have NaCl. Sodium is our metal, chlorine is our nonmetal, so we have an ionic bond. How about magnesium oxide? Again, magnesium is our metal, oxygen is our nonmetal, so we have again an ionic bond. And that concludes this video. Thank you so much for sticking around. I hope you learned something new and until next time.